Hey, hey, everybody, welcome to That Expert Show, where you help run the show. I'm Anna Cadano. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a fantastic expert and fantastic topic lined up for you today. We are talking DNA with 23andMe. Uh, this is such an exciting topic because I don't know about you, I have a lot of family members and a lot of friends that have done the spit test, they've sent it in, they've gotten their results back, and it's been really fascinating for them to learn about not only uh, the ancestry aspect of uh, you know, their DNA and their genealogy and the family heritage, but also the health aspects of what sort of conditions they might expect to develop in their lifetime and whether these you know kind of uh, data points have helped them alter their lifestyle is a whole topic for a discussion um, but you know it feels like every day right now we're hearing those stories about you know people that have found parents that they didn't know um, were out there because they were adopted or have they found long lost half siblings that they didn't even knew um, existed this is um, really groundbreaking information that is changing the way people think about their DNA and uh, their heritage. Uh, we're going to talk about the health side of things today. So I invite you right now, if this is a topic that you think would be interesting to uh, someone that you know, family and friends, feel free to tag this or share this or give us a retweet. We're live on Twitter as well. Um, our expert today is a healthcare geneticist, a licensed and certified genetic counselor who got her doctorate from Howard University. She joins us live from 23andMe headquarters in Palo Alto, Dr. Altavis Ewing. Dr. Ewing, thanks so much for taking time to talk with us today. Hi, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Anna. This is, um, you know, really uh, just forward thinking stuff that your company is doing. Um, I've been reading all about it and the different steps that you're taking to help people make better choices um, with their lifestyle. I'm really curious about that. When people actually get um, one of these health kits back, um, what kind of information does it tell them? And is it coupled with information about their history or can you just do the health portion of the test? Yes, so our, um, our Health Plus Ancestry service does provide individuals with information um, about their ancestral composition in addition to um, receiving more than 90 plus reports about genetic health risk, carrier status, as well as information about traits and um, wellness. Individuals are not able to do the health portion alone. Um, however, they would be able to opt into the ancestry only component if they choose to do so. Um, so you can view it as a two part product, either ancestry only or that health plus ancestry product. Interesting. Okay. I started to hear about this several years ago because a lot of my friends were doing it. I haven't actually done it yet because I don't, I don't know why. I have certain reservations and um, maybe concerns um, about, you know, what is done with that information. But I know this is so popular for people right now. Um, is there evidence to show that the health information that you get back, you know, diseases that you might be more predisposed to develop in the course of your lifetime, how does that information affect people? And is it actually changing the way that they live? Because I know that, you know, if, if some of those conditions have to do with bad health habits, for example, just bad eating or bad decisions that you make, um, bad habits are hard to break. Yeah, so the thing that really drives our company is that we're truly mission-based. So everything that we're doing is for our customer and with our customer in mind. Um, so we really believe in providing people with access, understanding, um, and helping them benefit from the human genome. Um, and we understand that everyone makes the best decision for themselves. So people will process information very differently. Um, but we really believe that providing people with this genetic health risk information is important empowering and helps um, position people to make the best decisions for themselves and to hopefully feel empowered to have conversations with their healthcare providers where they feel 
confident in driving that conversation with their healthcare provider. Um, we always try to reiterate or emphasize that genetics is oftentimes just one piece of the puzzle when it comes to health um, and risk for various conditions, but we want to make sure to present that information in a manner that's easy to interpret, easy to understand, um, and helps people feel confident um, when they are engaging with healthcare providers. You bring um, up a good point. Uh, if I can interrupt for just a moment, because you're talking about your healthcare providers, you know, um, how is that information being received? So, like, if I do the 23andMe Health Report and I take that information in to uh, my doctor, I'm fortunate to have a primary care physician. A lot of people aren't. Um, but if you take that into a doctor, um, how is that being received in the medical community? Like, will I be taken seriously um, by my doctor or what kind of conversation, you know, is, does that spur? Yeah, so that's something that we're working really hard um, to influence and impact here at 23andMe. So we have a dedicated medical education team, um, which is really diligent about reaching the healthcare workforce to um, assess individuals' understanding of genetics and clinic and to, again, hopefully help empower healthcare providers um, about genetics information and integrating that into clinic as well. Um, we are noticing that healthcare providers are feeling more confident in integrating this information into clinical care. Um, and we always emphasize that if one of our customers becomes one of their patients and walks through the door with a copy of a 23andMe health report, it's always important for that report to be confirmed, that result to be confirmed in a clinical setting. Um, and this is something that healthcare professionals do feel confident doing. Um, and it's something that a lot of them are accustomed um, to doing already. Hmm, interesting. So, uh, you know, uh, one, some of our questions, we have posted um, this topic on various social media platforms. And uh, Patty, for example, on Facebook wants to know whether this health test will tell you whether uh, you have sensitivities to particular medications. Is that one of the results you provide? So currently, that is not one of the results um, that is available in our current Health Plus Ancestry product, um, but we did receive authorization a few months ago um, to release information as it pertains to pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenetic testing. Um, so that is something, Patty, that will be available in the near future, but currently um, these reports are not available to our customers. Interesting. And what is what is the latest trend right now when it comes to the health aspect um, of the reporting that you do? What are you seeing, um, you know, coming on the horizon? So one of our most recent reports is our type 2 diabetes report. Um, and this is actually a report that we were able to make available to our customers um, through 23andMe powered research. Um, so this data um, was generated because our customers opt into research and they complete questions and answer questions about type 2 diabetes if they've been diagnosed. Um, and then we were able to calculate individuals' scores or their likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes based on that available data. Um, so this is what we call a polygenic score. Um, and this type of information is empowering for individuals because again, it's providing them with that genetic component that genetic piece of the puzzle for a condition that is not determined solely by genetics, but we realize that genetics plays a key role in that. So by letting someone know their genetic predisposition for type 2 diabetes, it helps them understand their potential likelihood of developing the condition and allows them to read up on the condition and then hopefully feel empowered again to talk to their healthcare provider so that they can learn more about the tools and resources to help manage that risk. And in a number of instances, um, we're hoping that we'll be able to see that individuals who find out they have this genetic predisposition and may be diagnosed with prediabetes, we may be able to see that there is a delay or even the prevention of that progression from prediabetes to diabetes. What I know um, about so diabetes is that um, it affects a disproportionate number of African Americans. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but when you have a genetic database um, where only, uh, I, I think it's like 20% of your genetic database uh, is non-European, is that um, a struggle for 23andMe in helping people develop um, a broader base of information um, when, 
you know, the, the population, the genetic population um, that you have, the information that you have, doesn't match up with necessarily the people that are submitting 23andMe tests? So the, the question that you raised, it's a really good one. And actually, this is an industry-wide problem that we're seeing. Um, it's something that all of science is experiencing, where we do have this underrepresentation or this absence of certain um, diverse racial and ethnic populations. Um, however, at 23andMe, um, we do know that we have one of the largest databases to date um, of various ethnic um, populations. And while our database is primarily European, um, we're able to tap into the numbers that we do have of people from various ethnic populations to really recalibrate, retool, and even revisit some of the methods that we're currently using and other scientists are currently using so that we can tap into more of that rich um, genetic diversity to hopefully improve some of our models and some of our reports so that they would be more, more relevant um, for people people of various ethnic populations. So this is something that we take very seriously and something that we're working day in and day out to make improvements in. Something I'm just curious about for myself, like I'm, you know, ethnically Chinese. I was born in Taiwan. I think that's been one of my reservations to do um, this kind of testing, even for the ancestry side, because I'm like, well, what sort of results are they going to have? Because you know, the bulk of my relatives are across the Pacific Ocean and may or may not have, you know, submitted their information. Is there is there hope for someone like me <laughs> to get quality oh, information back? Yeah, so absolutely. So one thing about 23andMe and our research initiatives is that um, for years, for decades, we've been partnering with scientists um, across the globe and even conducted several research studies where we're reaching out to people who are part of underrepresented groups to get them to participate in the research experience. And their participation has allowed us to actually improve our product for all of our customers. Um, so to date, we're looking at the genome, we're looking at individuals' genetic makeup, and we're looking at markers that are associated with more than 1,000 regions worldwide. Um, so this is an effort that we're able to do because people are opting into research, they're getting involved in those initiatives, and we're also going out to identify like who are the scientists who are working with some of these underrepresented groups um, because we want to make sure that we're as inclusive as possible as possible so that we can improve our product and make it relevant to people of all ethnicity. One of the things that, you know, got the biggest headlines for 23andMe was a big partnership with a pharmaceutical, GlaxoSmithKline. So um, what do you say to people who are concerned um, that their genetic, genetic information is submitted to you and used for research within these partnerships? Um, you know, if somebody is concerned about participating, maybe unwittingly, in that kind of research, is this the product for them or should they stay away? Um, so again, we do respect everyone's decision, but the thing that I would emphasize is that we truly are a mission-based company, um, and we are trying to truly make sure that this information is accessible um, and benefits everyone. So with our GSK partnership, we do realize that people may have reservations, um, but we want individuals to know that we take numerous protections and have safeguards in place to protect individuals' privacy and their data. Um, but when it comes to research, again, as you mentioned, it is something that individuals can opt into. But if at any point, if they ever felt uncomfortable with that research experience or if they had numerous questions, um, they can always opt out of that experience or they're always encouraged to reach out to our company um, through our customer care line um, where we could definitely answer some of those questions for you point you in the direction of blogs that we've written um, where we talk about those protective measures that are in place. Um, but at the end of the day, we do want to respect everyone and provide them with options so that they can make the best decision for themselves. So even if you opt out of research within 23andMe, um, your information still might be shared with third parties, though, that have partnered with the company, though, right? If you opt out of the research component, um, then your data would no longer be used um, or provided to um, 
those third parties. And additionally, when we are providing data, it's actually aggregated data. So it's not on an individual level at all. So people could not be identified. Um, but when someone does choose to opt out of that research experience, then your information would be removed. And then what do you say to the person who has privacy concerns on an individual basis? Like, it's obviously very sensitive information, you know, that you are holding as a company. And we know that, you know, uh, information data breaches are pretty widespread now. I'm assuming that you take the highest levels of uh, precautions to, to guard against those things. But if, for example, you know, I sent you my test and my test came back with a predisposition toward um, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, um, if that information for some reason became public or was obtained in a data breach, could that prevent me from obtaining life insurance? Because a life insurance company would look at that and say, well, we can't insure this person with that in your potential future. So the reports that you mentioned specifically, um, they do fall under our sensitive health um, risk category. Um, and these are the categories where individuals will, will provide information about the details of the condition as well as some of those sensitivities um, that could potentially come along with it. So we want to make sure that people feel equipped to make the decision to decide if this is the right information for me at this time, um, and to also realize that this is information that extends beyond the individual and can also impact a family member. Um, and there is a federal law in place called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, um, which protects individuals against employment discrimination as well as health insurance discrimination. But as you've mentioned, that law does not expand or currently um, protect individuals um, from receiving or from being discriminated against as it pertains to life insurance or even disability insurance. Um, so that's something that we as healthcare professionals and individuals in the genetic space, we're hoping um, will improve over time. Um, but there are instances where that sensitive health information, um, it's currently, we don't have those safeguards in place for all of it right now to, mm. to cut across categories. You know, the fun part of all of this um, are those amazing stories. I think the company shared some uh, reunions, you know, over Father's Day weekend, which just passed of, um, you know, people who have found families, the ancestry side of this. Um, we do have a couple of questions from folks about the ancestry side, if you don't mind. Christy, for example, okay. wants to know, how can siblings with the same parents have such different genetics? So siblings with the same parents can have different genetics because you randomly inherit your DNA from each parent. So while siblings will share approximately 50% of your DNA in common, um, you don't share the exact um, same components in common. So that just has to do with random segregation and the way that the, the chromosomes divide and sometimes cross over. Um, during reproduction. Interesting. Well, and so here's a different twist on that. We'll see if you can <laughs> interpret this woman's questions because I really okay. had to almost map it out on paper to figure out what she was asking. Shereen wants to know, um, this is from Twitter. She says she just sent her, you know, stuff in, her spit in. What I'm most curious about is whether a cousin of mine will show up as a sibling or as a cousin. Our moms are sisters and our dads are brothers. We have always wondered what our DNA would reveal to us. So that is that is one that I would have to map out as well, draw out a pedigree. <laughs> but because your your parents are, um, it seems they may be doubly related. You would share more DNA in common um, than most cousins would share in common. So it is possible um, that you could share anywhere around. Um, I'm just going to say you're going to share more than the same amount of DNA in common than your your cousins would. Um, but it would be best for me to probably draw that pedigree out and <laughs> to find out how they're related exactly. Um, but yeah, really good question. So it keeps me on my toes and makes right. me realize that I should stay up to date with drawing out those pedigrees. Well, and so when you get the results back, does it um, designate certain people in your family who've also done the testing with a label, like this person is a sibling or this person is a cousin? 
So there is a component within our product called DNA relatives. And this is a component that people have to, again, actively opt into. Um, so it, if someone opts into that DNA feature, DNA relatives feature, and if you opt in as well, then it will show you the amount of DNA that you share in common with that individual. And based on that amount of DNA um, that you have in common, it will predict um, the degree of relationship with that individual. Um, so for instance, um, I have siblings um, and a, a parent in the DNA database, and it accurately predicts um, the degree of relation based on the amount of DNA that we share in common. Interesting. Okay. Um, I think one of the most fascinating things about 23andMe and just the whole DNA testing in general um, has been the law enforcement side of things. I mean, we saw um, the crucial role that DNA testing played in capturing the um, or the uh, Golden State Killer suspect and how people that he didn't even know, um, I guess, who were related to him had submitted DNA testing along the way and that helped law enforcement narrow down um, their list of potential suspects and, uh, and eventually hone in on him. I have to assume this is a widening practice. Um, John on Facebook wants to know, why do you give information to law enforcement? So I can actually say that as a company, 23andMe, we have never um, provided law enforcement with any of our customers' information. Um, and again, this goes back to the fact that we take security and privacy very seriously. Um, and this is um, the Golden State Killer um, example is an example of where individuals actually they take their own DNA and they actively upload that DNA um, onto a server. Um, but again, to go back to your question, um, as a company, we have never provided law enforcement um, with any of our customers' information. Oh, interesting. So even if um, a law enforcement agency subpoenaed you for information, you're able to say you're able to deny the subpoena and not get in trouble with the law. So to date, we have never provided that information um, to law enforcement, and that is something that our privacy team um, would work very closely with law enforcement um, to ensure that it's something that we can continue and maintain to date. Fascinating. What would you want people to know about um, the health aspect of learning about your DNA? Like, if I get my test back, like this is, this is, you know, pushing me more in the direction of wanting to get the test and see what the results are. But if I get my test back and there's some really bad news in it, some bad indicators in it, um, well, I, you know, I guess everybody's reactions will be different, but I'm a little bit concerned that I would be depressed about that information, at least for a little bit before I go and try to take action to, you know, thwart the full effect of that disease. So we would want individuals to know um, that the information that we're providing, um, we hope will be received in a manner that is empowering for everyone. But as you mentioned, um, people handle that information very differently. Um, and as a result, we want to be very sensitive to that. And throughout our report, we include links um, that will allow people to identify a genetic counselor in their area um, if they would like to talk to a genetic counselor about some of the questions and concerns that they may have. Um, and then we're also pointing individuals towards resources of support support groups, patient advocacy organizations, um, as well as help articles um, in terms of questions, frequently asked questions that people may have about that particular condition um, as well. So we want people to know that we're not the type of company that just provides you with that information and that's the end of the story. No, we want to provide you with several resources that we hope will empower you throughout this journey. Um, and we recognize that everyone's journey is different. Um, are there some examples you can cite of um, people that you've worked with, customers who've been able to take that information and really make some different choices in their lifestyle that have led to results? Yes. So one example that comes to mind is a young gentleman um, in his 40s um, who for some time had experienced severe headaches. Um, 
And then his severe headaches were then accompanied by um, intestinal problems. So because of the di extreme discomfort, he um, eventually presented to his ER several times where they ran a CT scan and numerous tests and they were never able to identify what may have caused his headaches or even the GI problems. Um, so this individual eventually underwent the 23andMe test and he was actually identified to be a carrier of the two celiac um, the two variants that are associated with celiac that we test for. Um, and because he was able to identify this, he shared this information with his healthcare provider. Um, and that healthcare provider ordered additional testing. He ordered clinical testing. He even ordered an endoscopy um, to confirm that the individual was diagnosed with celiac disease. And as a result, his medical management has changed. Um, and then he's also made the decision to pursue a gluten-free diet. Um, and as a result, he has not experienced the headaches. He hasn't experienced the extreme GI issues. Um, and this all goes back to the fact that he was able to identify that he was a carrier of those celiac variants, talk to his healthcare provider so that they could take action together, and then he was able to modify his diet and his doctor uh, modified his medical management so that he could have improvements and feel a lot better. Interesting. Yeah, I would assume that that sort of scenario would apply to a lot of people. Any last thoughts? Um, the last thing that I would want to add is, again, just going back to the fact that we are a company um, that truly believes in empowering our customers. Um, and this is something that we cannot do alone. So we do have those research efforts, those research initiatives to improve the product so that we can provide more accurate ancestral composition reports and so that we can also provide more relevant health um, related reports as well. So I, I'm a big proponent of encouraging people to get involved in research, ask scientists, ask us those difficult questions, um, ask us the, the concerns that you may have as well, um, because it's truly going to take a partnership for us to really see improvements and see numerous successes throughout the field and to make sure that everyone is able to benefit from all of the, the genetic information that we're gleaning today. Very good. Dr. Ewing, thank you so much for the information you provided and for your time. Oh, thank you. It was indeed my pleasure, Anna. <laughs> and thank you for joining us for this episode of That Expert Show. We covered a lot of ground there, I know. Uh, we'll be creating a tip sheet uh, based on the information that Dr. Ewing shared. You Remember, you can always connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook at Anna Canzano, Twitter and Instagram at That Expert Show. And if you don't catch this, Mondays at live at 11 a.m., that's what time we're on live. You can always go back and watch previous episodes on our YouTube channel, That Expert Show, or you can listen to us as a podcast on Apple iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever it is that you take in your podcasts. And, you know, you can check out um, all of that information. It's all in one place at thatexpertshow.com. Thanks so much for being part of this show and helping me run it. That's the whole idea is we interview great experts. We tackle the topics that you want to know about, and we answer the questions that you have on That Expert Show, where you help run the show.